The story begins in a magical place where we see a girl and a boy who's laying on a bunch of roots and stems. The boy's name is Ash Blake, who is also lying down on the rumble without an arm and is also about to die. At this moment, a giant mythical dragon turns into a beautiful girl and approaches Ash, calling him a dumb loser for sacrificing himself for a random girl and thinks it will be sad to see him go out like this. And the dragon girl thinks Ash deserves much better than to die in such a pathetic way. So she kneels down beside him and puts her hand on his chest and uses some kind of magic power to heal the boy, restoring his arm. But his new arm starts to form a dragon-looking tattoo on it which Ash will get to use later on. After receiving the new tattoo, Ash wakes up on a bed somewhere and suddenly a beautiful girl with pink hair starts to kiss his arm with the tattoo and also his chest and introduces herself as a goddess called Nabi, and told Ash this is his first ritual and required ceremony for the power that is about to be born within this world. But Ash seems confused, and asks why she's on top of him without anything on and just before he becomes a real man. He suddenly wakes up and thinks everything that just happened was only a dream and gets up out of bed like he normally does and goes to school. After, Ash heads to school and he is currently studying at the Insulaban Dragon R Academy, which happens to be the most famous dragon school which teaches its students how to tame dragons. Here, we see a girl named Jessica. She tells her friends that the festival is getting closer each day and will be here very soon. After, Ash appears and all the other students begin referring to him as the problem child of the school and start to whisper behind his back, as Ash has a pretty bad reputation in the Dragon Academy. They begin asking each other how the hell this boy even managed to enter this academy. Ash overheard some of the students and after he angrily tries to hit one of the students that are talking about him, but just at the last second, his friend, named Raymond stops him, and tells him to calm down and said he can't go another year behaving like this, and getting a quick temper. Then, another boy named Max tells him that he must learn to behave since they are no longer children and they are now in their senior years. After this, they all go to class where the teacher explains to everyone in the school that they will all receive a tattoo on their arm which is a symbol called a star brand. And this mark will symbolize you as a student who can partner up with a dragon and is also proof that they are the dragon breeders. And she also indicates to each of them that each mark is specific for each dragon so other riders cannot tame other people's dragons so everyone is unique in that way. After class, Raymond asks Ash why he is the only one who can ride the other people's dragons and doesn't understand why Ash is the only exception to the rule. This is because it's normally impossible for another breeders to ride a dragon that isn't their own. However, Ash replies to him, saying he has no idea why he's like this, and wants to understand himself and to learn why he has this power. At that moment, a blonde girl named Sylvia arrives who is apparently a princess, and starts ordering others to get out of her way, as if she owned the whole place. Seeing this, Raymond comments that despite having better grades, the other students do not approach her because of her disgusting attitude towards others. After that, Ray asks Ash if he intends to participate in the festival race, but this only reminds Ash that he he doesn't even have a dragon for himself like the others. While they talk, the third year president of the school named Rebecca appears. She is admired by all since she is extremely beautiful and Ray loves everything about her. Later, on the training ground, Raymond lends his dragon to Ash as he doesn't own one for himself and uses it to participate in a fight test in his class. When the test begins, Princess Sylvia proves to be one of the best in the class, controlling her dragon to beat the others with ease. On the other hand, Ash faces a student who proves to be a worthy challenge. However, when trying to dodge an attack, he accidentally hits Sylvia's dragon instead, causing the teacher to stop the entire class. Before dismissing them, he mentions that Ash should be more careful when riding a dragon that doesn't belong to him. Right after, Sylvia approaches Ash and slaps him, and annoys him about not owning a dragon of his own and she tells him that his dragon par is probably already dead which is why he hasn't found it yet. After hearing this, Ash gets angry and tries to come at her, but Raymond stops him again. However, he tells Sylvia to apologize to Ash since she cannot talk like that about his dragon. To which she replies that, if he beats her in the festival race, she will apologize to him and Ash ends up accepting the deal. At night, Ash has another dream and Navi visits him in the dream again and she doesn't have a thing on, and Ash explains how it's unfair to be all over him when he cannot use his arms, but she said it's fun for her to use him like this and that she must examine his body as he's the person who holds all the power inside him. And once again Navi told him that something is about to be born within this world and she has to witness it as she's his Navi and told him this is the last night they will spend together before he will be awoken. The next day, Ash gets up and covers his dragon R tattoo with a long bandage so that nobody else can see it. 
Then they all arrived at the race and when the race is about to start, Rebecca the student council president gives a speech where she tells the participants that whoever wins this race will win a date with her. And this makes all the boys go wild and they start getting serious. Sylvia also gets the opportunity to speak to the students and she goes up on stage to give her speech. However, she just says that they should all perform at their best and she gets off the stage immediately without saying anything else. This surprises all the other students who comment that Sylvia seems to have no feelings and is very strict when it comes to dragon tournaments. After, Rebecca fired a shot into the sky, starting the race and everyone starts running with their dragons, while Sylvia can fly, as many of the smaller dragons are still young and haven't formed any wings yet so the skill-based matchmaking is completely trash. But while they re the others start cheering them on. Even though Ash and Sylvia are enemies in the race, Ash realizes that Sylvia cannot move forward in the race because all the other girls are blocking her path as they are jealous of the princess. So Ash sees this and tells her he will eat them out the way if she sends him some feet pics, and she agrees. So Ash uses Raymond's dragon and his strength to push them all out the way, causing everyone to fall down. After that, Sylvia advances on flying away and mentions to Ash that even though he did this she still won't send him anything, and calls him a dirty scrub. Then the race continues on for a while, until Ash stops so that Raymond's dragon can rest for a bit. At that moment, Ash begins to hear something in the forest, and Ash decides to find out what it is. Advancing further, he sees a large airship in the forest and in addition, a man steps out and appears to Ash and points a weapon at him. After this, the man approaches him and apparently a girl was hiding behind the mysterious man and he is suddenly attacked by a hooded girl named Anya, who starts chasing him and hunting him down. He tries his best to run away, claiming that he hasn't even done anything wrong. However, she answers that the people of the Dragon Kingdom are all enemies to her, and while chasing him, they get closer to the edge of a cliff and she charges at him again but Ash swiftly dodges her attacks. This causes them to switch places, putting Anya towards the edge of the cliff and shortly after, part of the cliff breaks off and she is about to fall, but Ash grabs her hand at the last second, swinging her to safety but the girl pulls him off betraying him even though he saved her, and while he takes the fall he asks himself why he's so kind to others and if this is how he truly is about to die. This is when Ash looks at his tattoo which begins to light up in a light blue flame causing him to see what his own dragon par looks like for the first time. When Ash touches the dragon egg, a beautiful pink-haired girl is awoken and Ash is carrying her in his arms. He lands down below safely on the ground, but upon looking at her closely, he realizes that this is not a dragon and is just a human girl, and he begs the question if his dragon is not even a real dragon and something else entirely. He notices that she also looks a lot like Navi from within his dreams and he begins to think that maybe this is his long-awaited dragon after all, but can't make sense of it. He holds her in his arms as she was just born, and Ash is wondering if she's really his dragon, as this situation where a dragon appears in human form is completely unheard of, shocking him. When she finally awakens, she hits him sending him flying into the water. Amazed by her strength, he questions her, asking why she is so strong, but she reminds him that she is a dragon and she should be strong and reveals her identity to Ash as a dragon, not a human. She confirms that she is his par, and when he tries to tell her he would treat her well as her master, she is ridiculed by his audacity, and asserts herself as his master instead and not his slave, demanding that he will obey her and not demand obedience from her. It appears that everyone's predictions about Ash being a problem child and also the idea of him having a troublesome dragon may be 100% accurate, as she proves to be quite a problem for him already and has quite the attitude. After, he takes her to his dorm, but she insists he sleeps on the floor while she takes the bed for herself. Left with no choice, he complies. Throughout the night, she comes and bites him, leaving him wondering as to why she is like that. He eventually wakes up the next morning, covered in injuries. That morning, the school's student president, Rebecca, visits him. Rebecca informs him that she's come to inspect his dragon, as she has heard rumors of something unusual. Ash brings her inside, but when she sees the dragon, they look at Ash with a suspecting face, but he convinces them that he did nothing. When they ask why she's without cloths, the dragon questions why she should wear cloths when she's just a dragon and not human. Rebecca provides clothing and suggests that Ash take her shopping for all the necessities, assuring him that the Academy will cover the expenses. She also mentions that the Academy's renowned dragon doctor, Angela Cornwell, will visit to examine the dragon's origin. He shops with her, and the dragon consistently craves crepes instead of meat. 
He gives her the crepe she wants regardless, but she has a reaction and collapses. Fortunately, Sylvia passes by with her maid, Cosette, and explains that crepes contain anthar, synonymous with alcohol for dragons, and should not be given to them. They administer an antidote, and Ash expresses his gratitude for her kindness. Sylvia also apologizes for her previous remarks about Ash's dragon during their altercation, and he accepts her apology. After the shopping, Ash names his dragon Eco, which he had dreamt of giving her even before she was formed. As soon as he does, their star brands connect, creating an astral flow that connects their energy with each other to maintain their connection. Eco requests a visit to the restroom. A few minutes later, Ash notices that Eco hasn't returned. Concerned, he enters the ladies' restroom and encounters Sylvia, who scolds him for entering the female restroom. But he explains to her that Eco is missing, and she offers to help find Eco. She teaches Ash on how to connect his star brand with that of his par, and they connect their star brands. A bird comes out and traces him to where she is. It turns out that Eco has been abducted by a doctor who wants to dissect her to ascertain her true nature as a dragon. The doctor attempts to connect Eco to the dragwarf, but when Eco struggles, she brings out a knife for dissection. Fortunately, Sylvia and Ash arrive in the nick of time. Sylvia identifies the doctor as Angela Cornwell, the city's scientist, who was actually called to investigate Eco's peculiar situation. However, she knew the school would never permit a dragon dissection, so Angela decided to proceed illegally. In their attempt to rescue Eco, Angela attacks them, causing them to lose consciousness. As Ash is about to sleep off, Eco screams his name, claiming to be disappointed in him if he falls asleep. Their astral flow reconnects, granting him magical powers, and he confronts Angela and saves Eco. Eco hugs him, but when he touches her, she slaps him. The following day at school, Ash is shocked to discover that Angela is their new homeroom teacher. Sylvia feels intense jealousy towards Ash, wondering how he can ride any dragon while she can only ride her loyal pal, Lancelot. She thinks about how Lancelot has been a great help to her and made her a prototype dragon are due to their close bond and his great skills. Although she is grateful to Lancelot, she still hopes that Lancelot will one day become a maestro so she can be promoted to the position of an arch dragon R. Frustrated by these thoughts, she tests her skills by attempting to ride other dragons. She instructs her subordinates to prepare a dragon for her test. When she climbs onto the dragon, it reacts furiously, leading to a struggle. Other students and Rebecca watch, bewildered by Sylvia's stupid decision. Ash ponders what might have driven Sylvia to take such a risk, and Rebecca reveals Sylvia's jealousy of Ash, believing she should have the ability to ride any dragon as he can. Rebecca summons her own dragon and intervenes to calm the angry dragon. Fortunately, she can end the entire issue without injuring any of the dragons. Once the commotion subsides, Ash wonders why Sylvia is jealous of him when she already possesses so much. Eco notices some villagers gathering to inspect a legendary statue, and discusses the concept of arch dragon skills with Ash. He asks if she would like to make him an arch, but she playfully scolds him for suggesting she should go to such lengths for him, considering him just a dog to her and means nothing. Anya visits the kingdom and is surprised to see Ash alive, as she assumes he would be dead after she pushes him off the cliff. She keeps this news from Milgaus, uncertain of how to tell him. When Milgaus inquires about the city's condition, she reports that Lotrimount Kingdom remains calm and quiet, as other kingdoms know they alone can wield dragons. Milgaus plans to attack the city and releases a previously dead dragon he had revived. These revived deadly dragons are called Necromancia. He sends the Necromancia, a rotten dragon, to assault the city. As students attempt to combat the dragon, they realize it's a decaying, regenerating creature. Sylvia is startled, sitting helplessly on the floor, while Eco tries to fight the dragon but gets entrapped. Rebecca is the last one standing, launching numerous attacks on the dragon, but none of her attacks have a lasting effect. Recognizing the gravity of the situation, Rebecca implores Ash to ensure Sylvia's safety as the princess. He pleads with Sylvia to stand up and reminds her of her responsibilities as their princess. Since she refuses to shake off the shock, he slaps her, shaking her to snap her out of her shock. The necromancia swallows Eco, and Ash begs Sylvia to summon her pal so they can fight the dragon and rescue Eco. Sylvia calls upon Lancelot, and they engage the dragon. Inside the dragon's throat, Eco encounters Nabi, who reveals her prior interactions with Ash and tells Eco that she has Ash's body shape in mind and emphasizes the dire situation. Nabi shows Eco Ash's ongoing struggle to save her. Realizing they need to save Ash and themselves, Nabi offers to create an arch for Ash, provided Eco gathers the necessary shields. Eco reaffirms that she doesn't have the ability to create an arch, 
So Navi advises her to create a fake one to train herself for her first original arch. She successfully creates an arch for Ash, who wears the silver knight arch attire and takes to the sky, defeating the dragon. Nilgaus realizes his plan has failed and suggests they leave. He mentions that they haven't entirely failed because they have both the boy and the girl, leaving Anya perplexed. Following this incident, Rebecca acknowledges that their security is not as solid as she thought. She invites Sylvia and Ash to join the student council to strengthen the country's defenses. Both agree, and Rebecca initiates their induction ceremony. Iko, witnessing Ash's dealing with Rebecca, and feels the reaction doesn't respect her stand as Ash's pal, so she vents her frustration by giving Ash a firm slap for seemingly neglecting her. Sylvia recollects about a moment from her childhood when, at the age of seven, the mother dragon was bestowing baby dragons to children, but she was left without one. Determined to find her own dragon, she embarked on a risky journey into the forest, where she got injured and exhausted. Weakened and on the verge of giving up, she sleeps on the floor by the bush in tears. She encountered a boy who advised her to quit, but her determination made her insist that she would keep going until she found the mother dragon and got her dragon. He offered to help her find the mother dragon. He decided to take her around the bush and carried her on his back. She thinks about the boy, concerned about his well-being at this time. But unknowingly to her, the boy is Ash. Ash, on the other hand, notices a teddy bear in his room, the same one Sylvia held that day. He knows he remembers the teddy, but he can't quite recall where he's seen it before. As the students return to their routines, Rebecca announces the new members of the student council, and they give their speeches. Iko becomes angry when students laugh at her during her speech, but Ash reassures her that they mean no harm and they are only trying to relate with her as they aren't used to seeing human dragons. Ash discovers that a new fan club has been created in his name, the Silver Knight Fan Club, dedicated to the Silver Knight who defeated the Necromancia dragon. The club's leader, Jessica, visits the senior class to inquire if anyone knows the Silver Knight's identity. Ash and the others who are aware of his secret maintain their silence. Jessica explains that she's looking for the Silver Knight because she believes she's meant to marry him, a statement that leaves the other students shocked. Rebecca later reveals that she is Jessica's sister and explains that Jessica has always sought a path to nobility. She thinks that marrying the Silver Knight will help her attain noble status as fast as possible. In their kingdom, an arch dragonar gets a noble status, and, surely, the Sylvia Knight will become an arch dragonar, so if she marries him, she will become a noble. She advises Ash to keep his identity as the Silver Knight hidden if he wants to avoid Jessica's advances. In another part of the city, Anya assumes a disguise as a little girl to gather information about the boy who defeated the dragon, a task she's not particularly pleased about but has no choice but to do it for her master. Rebecca also announces that the first princess, Veronica, who's earned the nickname Iron Blood Valkyrie, due to her hot blood, will be visiting the school following the recent incident. Veronica is Sylvia's older sister, but the mere thought of seeing her terrifies Sylvia. She has had unpleasant experiences with Veronica, who had trained her rigorously to become a skilled knight. One memory stands out when Veronica threw a dragon at her and handed her a sword, expecting her to fight her way out. Although Veronica claims it's for Sylvia's benefit, these memories have left Sylvia fearing her sister. When the day of Veronica's visit arrives, Sylvia initially withdraws into her shell and refuses to leave her room making everyone assume she won't attend. However, she remembers the little boy who had helped her on her journey to find the mother dragon, a boy who almost sacrificed his life for her. She recalls the promise she made to that boy to become a great knight. Determined not to back down, she overcomes her fears and joins the event just as Veronica arrives. Veronica arrives and asks about her sister. When Sylvia timidly comes out, Veronica confronts her in conversation. When she feels Sylvia isn't responding as she should, she draws her weapon against Sylvia and attempts to strike her, asking if she thinks she can deceive her. Sylvia jumps back in alarm, but Veronica sees through the disguise. Colette removes her wig, revealing herself as the imposter, but Veronica knows Sylvia couldn't deceive her. She calls for her sister and Sylvia trembles as she approaches. Veronica scolds Sylvia, calling her a coward and claiming she lacks knight qualities. She suggests that Sylvia should consider a different path, such as motherhood, as she believes Sylvia has no fighting ability. She would only be a disgrace to the entire noble family with her horrible skills. This humiliation brings Sylvia to tears. Ash intervenes, confronting Veronica about her treatment of her younger sister and asking her if it is noble for a noble family member to insult her sister in front of the public. However, before he can reach Veronica, 
Her knight, Glenn, attacks him. Veronica recognizes Ash as the Silver Knight who saved the city and orders Glenn to restrain him. It's revealed that Anya is actually a former member of the Tantalos family named Shamara. She is now bound to serve her current master because he had saved her city from Veronica. She overhears that Veronica is in the city, and all members of the Tantalos family prepare to confront her. Knowing it would be suicidal for any of them to approach Veronica, let alone confront her, she rushes to stop them. Ash is placed in the care of a maid named Prim, who helps him get ready to join Veronica in the pool. They bathe with Rebecca and discuss the possibility that the Necromancia could be the work of the Zephyros since they are the only country known for their engineering and scientific capabilities. Although Veronica suspects it, she lacks evidence to confront them, so she gives up on the thought. She then tells Sylvia that she has brought a marriage proposal. With their brother, Julius, killed for slaying a dragon, there's now no heir to the throne, as the other members are females. Veronica advises Sylvia to marry and give birth to a son to ensure the continuation of their bloodline since she deemed Sylvia worthless as a knight. Talking about Julius brings back Sylvia's memories of her elder brother. Knowing this, Veronica tells her she will marry one of Julius's old friends, Glenn, her knight. This doesn't go well for Sylvia, but she knows she can't go against her sister. Ash comes to Sylvia's defense once more, insisting that she isn't as useless as they think she is and that she played a significant role in the recent war, and he couldn't have won without her. Veronica disputes his claims. She challenges Sylvia to prove herself in the competition the following day if she genuinely wants to convince her that she is doing great. During the competition, Sylvia faces the school's strongest dragon, Kuchu Lane, who is Rebecca's pal. Kuchu Lane injures Sylvia, and Ash rushes to her side. As she recovers, Glenn arrives with a message from Veronica. Sylvia is instructed not to escort Veronica to the city the next day. Instead, she must visit the St. Valery Temple to pray to God for disgracing the royal family. Veronica implores Sylvia to engage in some soul-searching to find a way to help their family. Before Glenn leaves, Sylvia asks if he is interested in marrying her, but he states that he will do whatever Veronica asks of him. Ash intervenes, but Glenn warns him not to meddle in matters that don't concern him because the fact that he is a hero won't save him from the repercussions of interfering in issues he isn't called to. That evening, Rebecca and the other members of the student council devise a plan to escort Veronica the next day. She informs them about a woman named Avdacha who once attacked Veronica in the city and how she is a great threat to Veronica and how they should be mindful of her. The following day, Sylvia visits the library as commanded. While Sylvia is praying, she overhears Jessica praying to marry and become impregnated by a knight. She confronts Jessica about her prayer, claiming it is a very unholy prayer to pray in front of God. And during their conversation, Avdacha arrives with her dragon and warriors, interrupting their discussion. Avdacha communicates her message to Veronica through her private airship, Sylvanas, showing them the bomb she brought to the temple and her intent to destroy the temple. She demands Veronica's head as retribution for the people she has held captive and threatens to kill at least one person when the temple bell rings. Veronica dismisses the threat, affirming she won't bow to a terrorist. Instead, she declares her intention to bomb the temple herself. This makes Ash more scared of her, wondering why she would decide to kill her sister and every other person in the temple because of her pride. At the temple, Jessica suggests to Sylvia that revealing her true identity as the princess would put her at risk, so Jessica offers to pose as the princess so Sylvia will be safe. Well, Jessica loves that nobility status, and she would do anything to get it even if it's just a hostage situation. Since Sylvia is a coward, she allows Jessica to pose as the princess. Jessica approaches Avdacha and claims to be the princess. Avdacha takes her hostage and threatens to kill her. Ash refuses to let Veronica bomb the temple, and Veronica suggests an alternative. She proposes that Ash negotiates with Avdacha while Eko makes him an arch to defend himself. Then, she and the other knights will break through the temple from beneath and save them. As they begin the plan, Arch goes to the temple to convince Avdacha. However, Eko struggles to create an arch. She encounters Navi, who tells her she needs to grow and develop into a true dragon for Ash to ride. Anya is also revealed to be a captive in the temple, there to search for her friends. But falling victim to the situation, she sees a crying baby and holds the baby to pet him. Ash meets Avdacha and informs her of Veronica's refusal to negotiate, explaining that Veronica plans to set the temple on fire herself. He questions whether Avdacha wants to lose her life over a ransom situation. In a twist, Avdacha reveals that she didn't intend to cause trouble. Her true objective is to find her younger sister. When a little boy with Anya makes noise, Avdacha attempts to kill Anya. 
Sylvia refuses to watch a citizen die while she is there, so that prompts Sylvia to summon her courage. Sylvia steps forward and reveals her true identity as the princess, offering herself to die as a knight instead of watching civilians get hurt due to her own cowardice. Glenn infiltrates the temple through an underground door, and a battle ensues. During the fight, Avdotch's dragon attacks Ash, but Eko successfully creates the arch that defends him. They win the battle, but Jessica realizes that Ash is the Sylvia Knight and confronts him, asking him to impregnate her, to which he refuses. Ash later comforts Sylvia and carries her on his back to her room, a gesture that feels familiar to Sylvia because that is the same way the boy who saved her in the forest carried her. That night, Jessica ambushes Ash in his room, but he chases her away. Due to her obsession, she is removed as the president of the Silver Knight Club. She joins Rebecca's club instead. Ash also encounters Avdacha at their school. When she confronts Avdacha, Rebecca reveals that Avdacha was sent by Veronica to toughen Sylvia. Since her confrontation with Veronica five years ago, Avdacha has been working for Veronica. When Ash inquires about Avdacha's motivations, she discloses that she is searching for her sister, Shamara. Little does she know that her sister Shamara is now Anya. After their eventful adventure, Veronica returns to her city. As part of her plan to infiltrate the school, Anya secures a job at the school's eatery and starts working there as a waiter. Meanwhile, Iko experiences a very strange dream. In this dream, she encounters a dragon that bears a striking resemblance to the Necromancia. The dragon attempts to strangle her and declares, it is time to end it, while also referring to her as the daughter of Avalon. This dream leaves Iko feeling extremely troubled. She's too weak to attend school that day, so she stays home. On his way to school, Ash meets his friend Raymond, who informs him about an upcoming camp that week. This camp is exclusively for selected students in the school, and the chosen students are to be announced that day. During the assembly, a student, Lucas Arlinen's name is called. When Lucas Arlinen's name is called, the other students react with grumbling and displeasure. Ash is curious about why Luca is so disliked, as he's never met her before. He asks about her from Raymond, who explains that Luca is a junior member of the student council. She's known for her incredible strength and talent, having even surpassed Rebecca's track record. However, the reason other students don't want her to attend the camp is that she hasn't been to school for nearly three months, leaving them disoriented about why she was chosen. After the initial announcements, Rebecca reveals that she has the authority to select another student for the camp, and she chooses Ash. This decision surprises Ash, and he questions her about the reasoning behind it mainly because he doesn't have a traditional dragon to ride on like the other students. Rebecca commends his skills and what Iko has done to help them and believes he needs further training, which the camp would provide. Their conversation is cut short when a fire is discovered in a student's room, Lucas. Rebecca rushes to the scene and finds Lucas sleeping in a coffin. She discloses that Luca is an Ecbladian with a dragon pal named Gawain. However, for the past three months, Luca has been unable to connect with Gawain. Despite Rebecca's inquiry, Luca explains that there have been no improvements. They all sympathize with her, but her situation appears to be beyond their help. Rebecca informs Ash that the issue is that Gawain's astral flow with Luca has been cut off, so there is no energy connection for them to flow with. Meanwhile, Iko continues tormented by the recurring dream, which is taking a toll on her. She eventually confides in Ash about the unsettling dream, and he tries to console her, assuring her that everything will be okay. On another occasion, Ash encounters Luca at the Dragon Home, where she attempts to connect with Gawain. Unfortunately, Gawain reacts aggressively and sends her away. Ash feels for her because he has also experienced the pain of not being able to have a pal himself. To help Luca reconnect with her dragon, Ash consults Rebecca. She suggests a potential solution, which is for Ash to ride Gawain to understand the issue and discover why Gawain refuses to connect with Luca. However, this approach would require Luca to make another attempt at connecting with Gawain. Luca agrees to try it, and she makes another heartfelt attempt to establish a connection with her dragon. But Gawain once again rejects her, causing her immense pain as she runs away. Witnessing Luca's struggles, Iko assists Ash in preparing his arch, and he prepares to confront Gawain and try to connect with the stubborn dragon. As Ash attempts to communicate with Gawain, the situation takes a turn. Gawain attacks Ash, shattering the arch and posing a significant threat to Ash's safety. Gawain attacks Ash, and the knight's armor shatters as Ash collapses. Gawain calms down after the attack, and other students rush to save Ash. However, when Ash recovers, he feels guilty that he couldn't help Luca and Gawain. Rebecca also informs him that it might be impossible for Luca to attend the training camp if she can't reconnect with her dragon pal since she really needs her pal for the training to be successful. 
This makes Ash even more determined, and he requests permission from Rebecca to enter the women's hostel to persuade Luca to ride Gawain again. She agrees on the condition that Iko accompanies him. Iko, on the other hand, isn't comfortable with this situation because she doesn't understand why humans are that passionate for each other and want to help themselves. Reluctantly, she decides to follow him. Ash and Iko visit Luca, and Ash engages Luca in a heartfelt conversation. Ash convinces her of the necessity to reconnect with Gawain to attend the camp, and she eventually agrees. However, Iko becomes irritable during their discussion and angrily throws the table. The students begin preparations for the camp. Milgaus arrives at their school and meets Anya, who provides him with updates from her investigation. She tells him about the camp and says she will follow them as a member of the school's diner. He reveals that he knows their camp's location, the Willingham Mausoleum at Lake Alons, and grants Anya the authority to meet him there. After Anya leaves, Milgaus speaks to himself and talks about how he is shocked that the daughter of Avalon has reincarnated not only as a dragon but as a humanoid dragon. He talks about how he can't wait to see her in her dragon form. The students all move to the campsite, and their first program is a day of fun, where they wear swimming suits. As their fun day continues into the evening, Ash walks away from the group. In the woods, he stumbles upon Luca, who desperately tries to persuade Gawain to let her ride him. When Gawain rejects her again, she collapses in tears. Witnessing this, Ash gets angry at Gawain's stubbornness. Ash confronts Gawain, insisting that Gawain must communicate his true feelings. He wonders why Gawain is so heartless that he can't even see the pain Luca is going through, and he can't understand her. He determines that he must ride Gawain and get him to communicate his true feelings, even if it leads to Ash's own demise. He attempts to understand Gawain's perspective and climbs on Gawain, which leads to an aggressive response from the dragon. However, Ash doesn't have an arch, which leaves him vulnerable, and he runs to the other side of the woods, drawing Gawain after him. Anya observes this event, uncertain of Ash's intentions. Ash desperately tries to reach Gawain but is thrown off by the dragon. Injured and collapsing, Luca comes to Ash's aid. Anya recognizes Ash's dire condition. At first, she feels he deserves it for what he did to her master, but she also remembers that he saved her despite her earlier grudge, so she decides to help him. She instructs Luca to seek assistance. Upon awakening, Ash finds himself in the High Dragon Workshop, where Navi explains that she brought him to better understand Gawain. Navi reveals that Gawain is a smaller dragon. Although he is strong and great, he is just weak at heart, and he is like every little dragon. Gawain apologizes for his aggressive actions against Ash, claiming he doesn't want any other person to ride him except Luca. He expresses that his withdrawn connection with Luca is due to his fear for Luca's safety. Three months ago, during the dragon dance, Luca fell off Gawain's back, leading to her fear of riding him, which was reciprocated by Gawain. Navi warns that Gawain has about five days left to live because he has been starved of energy due to the disconnection of their astral flow and unless Luca can reconnect their astral flow, he will die. Upon returning to reality, Ash shares this information with Luca, who is determined to save Gawain. In another place, Angela discovers a forbidden covenant book, which contains historical information about the kingdom. The book discusses two prominent families, the Avalon and the dark family of Nehalania, who emerged from the ruins of the former king, Imbloch. Meanwhile, Milgaus arrives, provoking conflict with Angela. Anya also attacks Angela, and Milgaus commands her to kill Angela. He also calls Angela Angie, a name only Prince Julius calls her. Milgaus starts having a conflicting mental turmoil. He speaks to himself, asking a being in him to stop disturbing him, and that being decides to spare Angela for now. Milgaus plans to release another necromancia. At the camp, Luca rushes to her fellow students to deliver an important announcement. Luca arrives to announce that Gawain is missing, causing concern among the group. Rebecca then shares the origin of their training camp, Willingham Mausoleum. It was named after a young master dragon named Nuada, who, out of pity for his sick master, cut off their astral flow and had no energy to survive on any longer. Nuada silently went to the mausoleum to die. When his master eventually recovered, she searched for him around the camp but found him already deceased. This made the mausoleum a resting place for young dead dragons. The group realizes that they must discover Gawain before it's too late, as he also has a few days left to live, and if he hides to die, it will be unfortunate. Rebecca suggests canceling their planned evening party to search for Gawain, but Ash notes that the students have been eagerly anticipating the celebration after the rigorous training. 
Sylvia proposes that student council members should discreetly search for Gawain to avoid causing panic among the students. But Ash thinks otherwise because if all the student union members leave, including the president, the students will get more concerned. Ultimately, it is decided that Rebecca will attend the party while the others undertake the search. Ash and Sylvia discover a connection leading to Willingham Mausoleum, where they believe Gawain may be. They also find Angela held captive there. Meanwhile, Milgaus releases several necromancia into the party. Realizing the dire situation, Ash begs Eko to visit the workshop and make an arch for him as he would be useless without an arch. However, Eko reminds him that he is just recovering from his injury, but he insists so her spirit disappears to prepare his arch. As they enter the mausoleum, Milgaus taunts Sylvia, saying that if Veronica had confronted him, he would have felt encouraged, but Sylvia is just a weak girl with no skills. He also calls her Sylvie, a name her brother, Julius, used for her. Milgaus awakens Nuada's necromancia, and a battle ensues. Fortunately, Eko completes the arch, and Ash throws on his knight armor to confront Milgaus while Sylvia faces Nuada. Ash attacks Milgaus and hits his arm but finds out Milgaus is using an artificial hand. Arch and Sylvia win their battles, and Milgaus concedes defeat, admitting that he needs to revise his opinion of Sylvia's strength, as she is now stronger. He eventually runs off. They watch their colleagues continuing to fight against the Necromancia. This makes Luca feel bad because she can only watch the fight and can't help in any way. However, she gathers her courage and begs Gawain to return, promising not to fear him anymore. Gawain reconnects with her and together they ride Gawain. She does the dragon dance and she uses it to defeat the remaining necromanches, thereby saving her colleagues. Later, Milgaus meets with Klaus, a member of the military nobility of the Zephyros Empire, and reports that their attacks were not entirely unsuccessful. Klaus expresses his desire to see the demise of Lotry Mount Knight County and the Chevron Kingdom, particularly at the upcoming Continental Congress. The students return to their school and celebrate their victory. During the festivities, they receive a letter from the king addressed to Sylvia, inviting her to attend the Continental Congress, and requesting her to bring Ash and Eco with her. The Continental Congress is a program held every five years among the five countries on the Arkstrada continent. This year, it is hosted by Lotrimout Country, and Sylvia, along with Eco and Ash, makes her way to the capital, Fontaine. Upon their arrival at the palace, the king requests a meeting with Sylvia, and she leaves Eco and Ash in the care of Prim. Prim takes them on a city tour and provides knowledge about the great places in the capital. During her meeting with her father, Sylvia is surprised by her invitation to the prestigious program, considering herself just a student and she is a weak student. Her father explains that Veronica recommended her presence, which shocks Sylvia as she and Veronica have never had a close relationship. Sylvia also takes the opportunity to inquire about their brother Julius's death during his execution, wondering if it was confirmed that her brother died. However, the king confirms Julius's demise. Julius was executed for the grave crime of killing his own pal, a crime even royal family members cannot escape punishment for, and had to be killed. However, when Sylvia leaves his room, she notices his demeanor changes with the question and figures that her father is lying to her. Later that day, Eko and Ash meet the king, who bestows upon Ash the title of a dragon R, even though Ash lacks a dragon to ride. Ash finds it difficult to accept the title because he doesn't have a traditional dragon. But the king assures Ash that Eko is unique and shouldn't be judged by conventional standards. Accepting the title, Ash becomes a dragon R. The group gathers for dinner where Sylvia questions the absence of the Zephyros king at the Congress. Her father explains that the Zephyros king, due to old age, has sent a representative in his stead. He acknowledges that he knows it is a lie but he doesn't want to pry further to avoid another war between the neighboring countries. Meanwhile, Milgaus meets with Anya and Klaus, introducing Anya to Klaus for the first time. Klaus reveals that he first met Milgaus ten years ago when Milgaus was wandering the city, having lost his arm and noble status and being banished from his city. Klaus starts to share more but is stopped by Milgaus, who presents a system designed to awaken a weak dragon. They plan to use it to revive Eko to her true dragon form and tasks Anya with kidnapping Eko the following day. That night, Sylvia dreams about the first necromancia that attacked her school. When she wakes up, she connects the necromancia to her brother's dragon, Mordred, realizing that they have similar walking patterns and attack similarly. She also recalls the striking resemblance between Milgaus and her brother. Sylvia decides to investigate the ruins of her brother's dragon, and upon getting there, she meets Veronica there. 
When Veronica wonders why she had visited, she reveals her suspicions about Julius. They both realize that every young dragon ashes, including that of Mordred, have been removed. That is more shocking because Mordred's ashes weren't buried where the public could access them and the information was only to the royal family. This maintains their position that Julius is still alive and could be Milgaus. Veronica begs Sylvia not to disclose this information to anyone so they can protect the family's reputation. As preparations for the mask festival begin, Prim helps dress up Eko in various outfits, but Eko rejects each one and asks for more. Frustrated, Prim tells Eko that she could never genuinely look human, emphasizing the innate difference between humans like Ash and dragons like Eko, telling her that no matter how she tries, she can't be with Eko. She explains that Ash will eventually marry, have children, and leave Eko behind. This realization saddens Eko, and she runs away in pain. Meanwhile, Sylvia confides in Ash about her concerns regarding her brother disguised death and her father's role in his execution. She admits she's unsure how to confront this situation, but she really wants to know if Milgaus is really her brother, and she doesn't know what to do. Ash advises her not to stress herself over it and suggests that she should approach Milgaus and ask him directly if he is her brother. Sylvia appreciates his counsel and embraces him. During this conversation, they realize that Eko is missing. Both Prim and Ash begin searching for Eko. A palace servant advises Ash to attend the festival while they look for Eko, assuring him that they know the castle well and will find her. Ash reluctantly attends the festival with a heavy heart, still worried about Eko. To his shock, he finds Milgaus at the festival. Confronting Milgaus, Ash questions his presence, and Milgaus claims it's a case of mistaken identity. Klaus arrives and reveals that he is the king's representative, and that Milgaus serves him. Sylvia intervenes to prevent Ash from further questioning and apologizes to Klaus, although they both know he is lying. After dancing with Ash, Milgaus comes to request Sylvia's hand for a dance. She dances with Milgaus during the festival and attempts to ask him questions to ascertain if he is truly her brother, but he evades her questions. After the dance, he angrily asks her if she wasn't thought that a dance should be done in silence, and questions and inquiries aren't allowed. Afterward, she informs Ash that she couldn't get a definitive answer but noticed that Milgaus dances similarly to people from their kingdom. Eko is eventually kidnapped by Anya, and Prim returns to the palace in tears. She contacts Sylvia and Ash and explains the hurtful words she used with Eko, which prompted her to run away. They launch a search for Eko, and Sylvia suspects that if Milgaus is indeed working with Klaus, the only plausible location for Eko's captivity within the castle would be on Klaus's airship. The experiment to reveal Eko's true form commences on the airship. Eko is placed in a water-filled drum, and it pumps energy into her to force her transformation. She screams for help, fearing for her life, and realizes how much she cares for Ash. When the scientists see that Eko isn't changing, they increase the energy output to the highest level. The system spirals out of control, causing Eko to transform into a grown woman who breaks free from the drum, spilling water everywhere. The energy system reaches its zenith, creating a powerful and startling figure visible to Ash in the castle. Everyone wonders if this is now the real Eko. As the figure initially appears like an egg, it soon begins to crack. Once the eggshell cracks, all the maestros, including Lancelot, start running toward her in bow and reverence. The maestros go out of control, and none of the knights can ride them. Even Sylvia couldn't ride her Lancelot. Eko continues to grow, breaking out of the airship and causing its destruction. Klaus is the first to complain about his airship's destruction, angrily yelling about the dragon's damage. While the king tries unsuccessfully to apologize, the king tells him the dragon isn't part of his dragons, and he has no idea of what is happening. But Klaus refuses to heed. Amidst the chaos, all other festival guests flee for their safety. Veronica arrives with Glenn and meets Milgaus. She speaks to him, expressing her curiosity about his true identity and whether he is her long-lost brother, Julius. Milgaus removes his mask, confirming that he is indeed Julius. However, he reveals that he possesses Julius's physical body but not his mind. Instead, he houses the spirit of Mordred, Julius's pal. He claims to be the true heir of the Dark Kingdom of Nehalania, a kingdom which, together with the Avalon family, are the descendants of the great king Imbalc. The people of the kingdom are from the family, just as it has been detailed in the Book of Covenant. Eko is disclosed as the reincarnation of the Princess of Avalon, while Mordred, as the heir of Nehalania, aims to take control of the county as he believes it rightfully belongs to him. He has hatched this plan for a while, but when Julius finds out his dragon, Mordred, is an evil dragon, 
He also hatches the plan to throw Mordred's spirit out. Hence, Mordred used aerial flow to manipulate Julius and led him to commit an unforgivable crime that resulted in his banishment, then completely took control of Julius's body. Although Julius is still some here inside the body, Glenn is furious that Mordred took his friend. He attacks Mordred, but he is too weak to defeat a dark demon. Mordred has found a new host and a perfect one as such, which is the new dragon Eco. So he leaves Julius's body in hopes of completely taking over Eco's body. Julius, regaining control of his own mind, embarks on a mission to confront Mordred, and he borrows Veronica's spaceship to join Ash in the battle against Mordred and gain control of Eco's body back. Meanwhile, Mordred attempts to control Eko's body completely but fails, hence seeks Navi's authorization to control her. Navi resists Mordred's request, leading to a confrontation between them, but she struggles through the confrontation, standing her ground that she believes more in Eko and Ash than she believes in him. In the process, Navi communicates with Eko, who is confined within her own body due to Mordred's influence. Navi encourages Eko to create her first original arch to help Ash in his fight. Eko initially doubts her ability to make the arch since she no longer has complete control of herself, but Navi teaches her that an arch is formed through the emotions a pal has for her knight, and she can do it successfully. As Eko still has deep feelings for Ash, she successfully forges his arch. Ash's schoolmates and their respective pals also join him in flying toward Mordred. When Ash confronts Mordred, a battle ensues. During the battle, Eko adorns him with her first original arch, and he forges ahead to fight Mordred. As Ash is about to strike Mordred with his sword, Mordred tries to convince him that injuring Mordred will harm Eko's body as well. However, Ash, knowing Eko well, insists that she cannot be injured. He successfully stabs Mordred, causing him to disappear. Ash awakens later in his bed with his friends surrounding him. They inform him that they witnessed Mordred's spirit heading eastward, and the festival ended once the battle began. His friends return to school, leaving Ash to speak with Eko who is injured from the encounter. Ash expresses his gratitude for her presence and willingness to be his knight. In response, Eko shares that she desires more than a knight and pal relationship. She wishes to be his lover. To solidify their bond, they seal their relationship with a kiss. In the end, Avdacha and the other knights raid Klaus's ship. On the ship, she finds Anya and realizes Anya is her lost sister, Shamara. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more please make sure to drop a like and subscribe to the channel with notifications turned on so you never miss a future video. And until next time guys, take care.